questa eh, sessione, la porta abbiamo il piacere di per conosco eh, Matteo Ioanni Settila, suo collega e amico dell'Università di Melbourne, Australia, che sta facendo un dottoramento nella propria, nella propria università. Eh, Matteo è un italiano con origine suisse, quindi abbiamo anche questa eh, dimensione eh, transfrontalista. Eh, di una formazione che è basicamente una formazione filosofica eh, fatta eh, in Università di Leuven, in Belgica, e anche in Milano, anche ora anche in Università di eh, Melbourne. La eh, prima investigazione di Matteo fu focata eh, nel pensamento americano, in particolare nel pragmatismo eh, di Uai e nel transcendentalismo di Emerson e poi mai di recente eh, focò eh, nelle letture eh, di eh, Pierre Ado e di Michel Foucault tiremo già l'occasione per caso di parlare un po' del nostro seminario di decisione di Coris che eh, era un'origine a un orizzonte di pensamento eh, sopra le pratiche di esistenza filosofia e di spiritualità di mais in generale a lungo a lungo della storia. E, collabora con il professor Matthew Sharp nella propria università di Chi. Collabora anche con il gruppo di investigazione Philosophy of Well Life dell'Università uh, Pontificia Gregoriana di Roma, con il gruppo Art Living uh, di do Fil Nova, dell'Istituto di Filosofia qui in Lisboa. Eh, e anche grazie a questa collaborazione anche Matteo sta eh, con noi anche all'Università di Aperta la sua questione attuale è focata nella recepzione eh, del protrettico perdito di Aristotele soprattutto nei autori cristiani della prima epoca attraverso la mediazione di Ortensio di eh, De Kinkel collabora con varie riviste si scrive già vari ensai e a ultima e, um, pubblicazione uh, The Tops of the Goods of Fortune in Consolazione 2 and 3 How to Console and Exhort War Axis che va a salire nella rivista Evo uh, Oggi uh, Matteo Stettler uh, sta con noi per parlare uh, da English portanto, ma anche attraverso un, uh, un powerpoint che aiuterà eventualmente le persone che non hanno in pratica di English a seguire meglio la sua propria presentazione. Il um, titolo della presentazione di Matteo è Lady Philosophy Therapy and the Goods of Fortune on the Medical Analogy in Boetis Consolazio Filosofia. Bom, la parola è tua, the word is yours. Thank you very much for uh, accepting also our invitation to stay here. Thank you, Dr. Ferraro, uh, and many thanks for uh, your kind invitation. I'm very humble to be here and to be talking to you all. You. Um, so uh, without further ado, I think we can just uh, dig right into uh, the presentation that I've prepared uh, for you today. I'll give you just a little background um, uh, concerning my, my contribution today. Um, this is an extract actually of my thesis of one of the last chapter of my doctoral uh, thesis that I'm writing. Um, at the present moment, but somehow it stands also at the intersection of a different line of research that I would like to um, to pursue possibly in my uh, postdoctoral studies. I'm currently working, as um, Dr. Ferraro pointed out, I'm currently working on the reception of one of the most famous um, exoteric writings by Aristotle in uh, the early Christian authors, and possibly in the future I would like to move on analyzing the reception of Aristotle's esoteric writings in um, the medieval authors, medieval Christian authors. That, that's why Boethius somehow uh, lies at the junctions of these two lines of research of mine. But I would say just let's dig right into it and introduce the problematic of my uh, presentation, um, which is a specific interpretative problem in the reading of Boethius's Consolatio. I'm referring to um, the repetitiveness of the surveys of the goods of fortune that uh, the character of lady philosophies um, offers 
first at the end of book two, and again, and repeats again in the beginning of book three of the Consolatio Philosophiae. Um, a problem that may be uh, easily the single most baffling aspect of Boethius's main work, uh, perhaps only second to the awkward silence that Boethius mysteriously kept on any of the Christian dogma in that book. As you can see here from the slide, uh, the French patristic uh, scholar Pierre Courcel's uh, own impression of the issue was that uh, lady philosophy's method uh, was particularly strange in these books. Indeed, as he writes, uh, to lead Boethius to true happiness, philosophy announces at the beginning of book three that she wants to show him false happiness first. But this review of false goods only takes up what was said about the goods of fortune in the previous chapter. So that's the main interpretative problem. Um, however characteristic of Boethius, we might uh, be inclined to consider this, um, this practice to be, as uh, Rand uh, noted early on, um, Lady Philosophy's presentation of the goods of fortune uh, presents and suffers from a certain clumsiness, and its repetitions are oftentimes uh, too direct to be simply explained away by reference to Boethius' pedagogical strategies. The chapters on wealth, office, and glory uh, of book three, Rand notes, uh, suggest too closely the, the discussion in the previous book without making any very significant additions, end quote. The task of identifying the reasons behind such a, an argumentative redundancy um, has been historically a complicated feat to resolve, one which has in time seen the proposal and not seldomly, seldomly also uh, the shelving of a plethora of wide ranging and often discordant uh, explanations. As we shall see, scholars have for the most part endeavored to account for this idiosyncrasy of Boethius's text, either by investigating the sources used by Boethius, or on the other side, by attending to the thematic construction of these books. In the second half of the 19th century, it was rather uncontroversial among classical scholar, scholars and philologists alike to argue that Boethius, uh, very much like Iamblichus, for example, before him, worked essentially by compilation, and that, albeit perhaps not as extensively as Iamblichus's Protrepticus, uh, Boethius' Consolatio heavily relied on the writings on the ancient, of the ancient Protreptic tradition. The scholar who has stretched the most this paradigm uh, is certainly uh, the German Eusener. In two, in two of his most influential publications, the German scholar has argued that uh, the study of the sources of Boethius' Consolatio reveals that the entire central nucleus of the composition is nothing but uh, um, an Im unimaginative re-elaboration of the themes that were already part of uh, Aristotle's lost Protrepticus or of a similar but most recent Protreptic like um, Cicero's or Tensius. Predictably, uh, Eusener's claim on the derivativeness of the entire central part of the Consolatio uh, was eventually not positively welcomed in literature, uh, where it was subjected to a multiplicity of more or less extensive qualifications and revisions. Uh, for Courcel, uh, attempts such as Eusener to find ancient parallels to Lady Philosophy's surveys of the goods of fortune cannot be but superficial. As, these, as this discussion really relies on tropes and commonplaces, uh, rhetorical commonplaces, which uh, no single author or philosophical tradition or uh, no single uh, genre of writing can possibly reclaim as uh, their prerogative. Methodologically, uh, according to the French scholar, this implies abandoning altogether any tentative to make sense of this interpretative problem of this repetitiveness of lady philosophy's accounts of the goods of fortune on the basis of either ancient sources or literary genre, and thus resort uh, to more, possibly more fruitful 
a thematic analysis of these books. In fact, according to Courcel, uh, contempor contemporary interpreters, uh, busy as they were trying to find the resources of the Consolatio, failed to notice that Boethius had somehow hidden uh, the underlying plan of the entire work in plain sight in, in what he considered as being the movement of the platonic conversion that is traced in the closing prosa of book one. In an interesting passage in which uh, Lady Philosophy uh, acting as it were as Boethius's doctor, as Boethius's uh, physician, identifies three uh, fundamental epistemologic, epistemic fallacies at the roots of her patient's health problems. In this regard, as the French scholars uh, concluded, uh, quote, it is therefore a question in the consolatio of a double conversion in three stages. First stage uh, would be the one of knowledge of oneself, which occupies the entirety of book two. The second stage is that of the knowledge of the supreme end, which occupies book three and four up to prose five. The third and final stage is that of the knowledge of the laws which govern the world, which occupies end of book four, and finally, book five. Uh, according to Courcel, it is precisely on the basis of this threefold progression of the platonic conversion that we can finally make sense and possibly dispense once and for all with the strangeness uh, that characterizes Lady Philosophy's method um, of exposition of the goods of fortune. Uh, he writes, these two successive studies of the goods of fortune fit into the general plan of the work as Corsell conceives it. The first, uh, the first um, survey of the goods of fortune relates to the phase of the know thyself of book three. The second prepares the subsequent definition of the sovereign good, the one which occupies book three and four, end quote. So as persuasive as, as Courcel's suggestion might, may appear at first sight, um, his thematic account of this complex interpretative issue cannot ultimately convince us. It certainly did not convince me. After all, it is the French scholar himself that at a certain point in his reasoning must admit that his proposition concerning the three-stage platonic conversion that Boethius putatively set himself up to attend in the entire work uh, holds only if we assume that Boethius himself did not strictly observe his own plan, uh, which is in, in my contention, a qualification which uh, makes uh, Corsell case, Corsell's case overall rather shaky. So it is my contention here that Corsell thematic criteria uh, proves uh, unsatisfactory ultimately because it fails to reconduct uh, the interpretative problem uh, that is constituted by the repetitiveness of Lady Philosophy's arguments in book two. In book three, to uh, the living praxis from which that problem might have emerged in the first place. And in perspective of which, as Ado has taught us, um, any such textual idiosyncrasy of the works of antiquity are usually best understood or best accounted for. And when I'm talking about um, the uh, living praxis, here I mean the concrete life circumstances in which uh, at the time of writing the Consolatio, Boethius found himself implicated uh, and in response to which uh, he felt the need of writing precisely such text. So let me read uh, to you this interesting quotation from uh, Hadot's What is Ancient Philosophy, where uh, the French scholar, I think, explained um, what he calls himself his methodological imperative. In order to understand the philosophical works of antiquity, as Boethius's Consolatio still certainly is, um, Hadot writes, uh, we must take into consideration the particular conditions of philosophical life at the time. We must discern the philosopher's underlying intention, which was not to develop a discourse which had its, uh, its end in itself, 
but to act upon souls. In fact, each assertion must be understood from the perspective of the effect that it was intended to produce uh, in the soul of the auditor or the reader, or I would add also the writer itself, himself or herself. Whether the goal was to convert, to console, to cure, to exhort the audience or himself or herself, uh, the point was always and above all, not to communicate to them some ready-made knowledge, but to form them. If then, uh, Ado concludes, we remember that philosophy's assertions are intended not to communicate knowledge, but to form and to train, it will then come as no surprise if we find Aporiai in Plato, in Aristotle, in, or Plotinus, or even Boethius, I should add. That is, points at which there are reformulations, repetitions, and apparent incoherences, end quote. So following Ado's um, um, principle, uh, his methodological imperative, um, I realized that Boethius's circumstances at the time of writing the Consolatio were in fact not simply those of someone who was failing epistemically to understand himself, the ultimate end of all things, and the laws governing the cosmos, as Coursel's thematic criteria might suggest. But his conditions were the ethically demanding ones of a former disciple of the Eleatics, of a former philosopher, that uh, waiting for his trial and eventually his execution in jail, um, in the meantime, has given in to despair and to sorrow. And as a consequence of his despair and his sorrow, um, he failed to live up to the philosophical ideal um, of life and death uh, set by his predecessors, uh, Socrates in Primis. In fact, it is arguably driven by this uh, difficult conditions that Boethius decides to take up paper and ink and write in his cell. That is, um, in order to console himself on his hardships and exhort himself once again to embrace philosophy, all of this via the fictitious literary medium of the personification of our personification of philosophy, namely lady philosophy. So this existential perspective uh, in which I propose to read the Consolatio, I think imposes us a shift in emphasis in uh, the medical analogy by which Boethius, the author of the Consolatio, uh, decides to stage his troubled spiritual condition. A shift away from the three causes of Boethius's illness, as they were highlighted by Cursell, and towards the two illnesses themselves that Lady Philosophy diagnoses Boethius with in book, in book one, as well as uh, a shift towards the dedicated treatments that Lady Philosophy will administer to her patient in the following books. So as we shall see, these elements of the uh, medical analogy in the Consolatio provide us with um, actually a much more effective uh, thematic criteria by which distinguishing the catalogs of the goods of fortune the Lady Philosophy lays down in book two and book three. Um, as I shall argue, the first survey of the goods of fortune is part of a series of consolatory discourses that um, as fomenta, as poultices, uh, lady philosophy um, administers to Boethius throughout the entirety of book two in order to console him on his misfortunes and dispel the passions that uh, obfuscated his reasoning, his, his, uh, his judgment, that is to say, uh, in other words, uh, to treat uh, Boethius's morbus perturbationum, uh, his disorder of the passions. Uh, secondly, I will argue that the second survey um, of the goods of fortune is uh, the so-called apotreptic part of a protractic, that is, of a, an exhortative discourse that, uh, as, a, as a, a remedium, as a remedy, lady philosophy hands out to her patient in book three, in order to awaken him from his temporary slumber, from his lethargy, his lethargus, his, mor his morbus lethargus, and then 
to bring uh, Boethius back to the philosophical way of living and inevitably in, also in his case, uh, the philosophical way of dying. Let's start from the diagnostic uh, phase in book one. With its opening prosa, Boethius uh, inaugurates the series of medical analogies that will govern and structure the development of at least the first three books of the Consolatio. And there he presents um, his alter ego in the text and lady philosophy as a patient and physician, as patient and doctor respectively, uh, thus ascribing uh, a multiplicity of diseases to, uh, to the patient, to Boethius, and as a consequence also a variety of diagnostic and therapeutic methods to uh, the doctor, to the physician, lady philosophy. At philosophy's uh, first intervention in the dialogue, at the moment in which, as you can see here from the image on the screen, um, lady philosophy drives away uh, the muses of poetry, um, lady philosophy there immediately identifies in Boethius a sick person, a sick man, um, an eger in Latin, and reclaims from the science of poetry the right to cure and heal him with her own muses. She says, uh, quote, leave him to be tented and healed uh, with the help of the muses that attend me, end quote. The um, contrast in appearance between the patient and the physician, uh, as some scholar suggested, helps us identify by which ailment, by which um, disease Boethius seems to be initially afflicted. Um, whereas philosophy enters the scene with, quote, glowing eyes that penetrated more powerfully than those of ordinary folk, folk uh, end quote, Boethius is so in Boethius's vision is so impaired that he will not even be able to recognize his own physician until well into the third prose. He says, my eyes were obfuscated and blinded with tears. I could not identify this woman, end quote. Moreover, if lady philosophy presents herself with a venerable, awe-inspiring look, Boethius's own face as he tells us himself, was, quote, heavy with grief and bowed down to the ground with sorrow, end quote. But um, as the development of the scene in book one uh, attests, uh, a temporarily obfuscated vision and a prostrate and grief-ridden countenance hardly exhausts uh, the state of perturbatio mentis, the distress of the soul, uh, of which Boethius is said to be suffering. Um, there, these are, are in fact uh, a few uh, of a, a multitude of symptoms that apparently troubled uh, the patient Boethius and that, uh, as we shall see now, will induce his physician to diagnosticate at her first guess a case of lethargy. So let's move to the first diagnostic stage. As well into their encounter, Boethius still struggles even to identify his own doctor. Lady philosophy launches her first diagnostic attempt. As Boethius recounts, quote, on seeing that I was not merely silent, but utterly speechless and struck dumb, she placed her hand gently on my breast and said, but his condition is not dangerous. He's suffering from lethargy a weakness common to deluded minds. He's, he has temporarily forgotten himself, but he will soon remember once he has identified me first, end quote. Um, Schmidt, the German scholar, uh, has persuasively, persuasively demonstrated that the description of Boethius' um, disease in the Consolatio actually uh, and very closely attends to the simple symptomatological accounts of lethargic cases reported in ancient medical literature. According to the scholar, Boethius chose to associate this particular condition to his alter ego in the text for one particular reason. In fact, in ancient medical literature, a lethargy was usually considered to be a sort of disease of the dark, of vision. 
um, as the scholar argue, this visual element associated with lethargy easily allowed Boethius to bring into play uh, what he calls the illumination metaphysics um, that played such an important role in, in Platonism and then in Neoplatonism and in general, and was so important uh, to Boethius in particular. As a matter of fact, Lady Philosophy preliminarily uh, set herself to treat her patient by precisely dispelling the clouds of worldly worries that obscured uh, Boethius's vision with the metaphorical gesture of wiping his tearful eyes, in a very poetic phrase. He says, quote, to help him in this, that is to help Boethius uh, recognize his own position, I must spend a moment wiping his eyes for the darkness of his mortal concern has clouded them, end quote. Now, Lady Philosophy's hopes to awaken Boethius uh, to his own, uh, firstly to his physician and then to himself, however, are only partially realized at this therapeutic stage. In fact, if the patient does eventually recognize his doctor, uh, philosophy first attempt um, at treating uh, Boethius's self-forgetfulness and to remind that to remind Boethius that he is, after all, a philosopher, uh, fails rather miserably. In fact, for all the references to, um, to the old philosopher's uh, tragic and yet honorable debts uh, with which Lady Philosophy manages to present to her patient, from uh, Anaxagoras, Socrates, up to Canius and Seneca and Soranus, Boethius, rather than uh, letting this, uh, this example somehow sink in as a reminder of his identity as a philosopher, he cannot help but behave like the proverbial donkey listening to the liar, which is to say that overwhelmed by his own suffering, um, he turned deaf ears to these examples and pitifully bursts into tears. Let's move to the second stage that uh, um, regarding the morbus perturbationum, the disorder of the passions. So Boethius's complete unresponsiveness to her initial treatment raises uh, philosophy's suspicion that she may have possibly either misdiagnosed or at least partially diagnosed um, Boethius's condition and that she may be dealing with something uh, more complicated than a relatively simple case of lethargy. Uh, thus, with a little impatient uh, at this point, she asks Boethius, um, reciting an Homeric verse, quote, why are you weeping with the tears running down your cheeks? Out with it, nor hold it fast within your breasts. Uh, if you seek the physician's help, you must uncover the wound, you must uncover the vulnus, end quote. What the following passage uh, reveals of Boethius's condition actually exceeds Lady Philosophy's worst diagnostic expectations. At the source of Boethius's vulnus, or at the source of Boethius's uh, wound, um, as he himself uncovers it, uh, there seem to be laying both the whims of fortune and worldly injustice. He says, for myself, Boethius writes, I have been parted from my possessions, stripped of my offices, blackened in my reputation, and punished for the services I have rendered." End quote. So the um, passionate and at trade rather violent uh, fashion in which Boethius exposed and defended his case before Lady Philosophy makes her realize another important aspect of her patient condition, and finally delineate a second alternative treatment path. So the vehemence with which Boethius accused the Senate of injustice, the way he grieved for the accusations leveled at philosophy, and lamented the damaging of philosophy's reputation, but above all, the very way in which he invaded um, against fortune's whims, he complained about the rewards and punishment of this world, 
And uh, at the close of his furious verses, the way in which he prayed for the heavens and earth to be governed by the same law of retribution, all of this, according to a lady philosophy, suggests that Boethius's disease, that is his lethargy, is further aggravated, is in fact tumorized, uh, she used these words, with, uh, with a worrisome disorder of the passions, with a perturbationum morbus, one which, as we shall see now, uh, will require special medical care. So this, and here I shall quote, this velter of disturbed emotions weigh heavily upon you. Grief, anger, and melancholy are tearing you apart. So in your present state of mind, you're not as yet fit to face stronger remedies. For the moment then, I shall apply gentler ones so that those ailments that hardened to form a tumor because of the passions that have flowed in it may soften under a, a more caressing touch and may, be, uh, may become ready to bear the application of more painful treatment. Mm. Now, it becomes uh, clear now why Lady Philosophy's first attempt at treating Boethius's lethargy did not deliver the expected results. So the um, effusion of passions in Boethius's soul had hardened uh, his morbus, has hard, had hardened his um, uh, disease, his lethargy, to such an extent to render ineffective common therapeutic responses. As we are told at this stage, each of these two diseases afflicting the patient, that is the tumorized lethargy on the one side and the disorder of the passions that alimented the uh, lethargy uh, will be treated separately with dedicated medicines. So the former ailment, that is the lethargy, will be eventually eradicated by remedia validiora, by stronger remedies, while um, the morbus perturbationum, the disorder of the passions, uh, will be initially suited uh, with uh, leniora, with gentler remedies, with gentler um, medicaments, um, the exact composition and the posology uh, of which will become clear only as we proceed with our uh, discussion. But let's move to the final stage of the diagnostic part of book one. So as convincing as the diagnosis of a lethargy complicated by a disorder of the passions may be um, in light of Boethius's symptomatology, lady philosophy does not seem to be able to make sense of how her former disciple um, may have possibly developed such acute diseases. To understand the causes of Boethius diseases, um, as any scrupulous doctor would do, lady philosophy thus decides to subject her patient's mind to a final visit, a final test. Lady philosophy's clinical interview, uh, as some scholar did not uh, fail to notice, um, is modeled on the Socratic method described in the Platonic Dialogues. So starting from a notion on which um, the two parties agree upon, philosophy little by little brings her patient to reveal his um, epistemological flaws and therefore to reveal his ignorance. The starting point uh, of this dialogical passage is thus the conviction that God uh, the creator superintends his creation, which is to say that the course of the world is not governed by accident, but it follows a rational principle. A proposition that uh, notwithstanding his momentary confusion has Boethius so convinced of its truthfulness that Boethius is actually declares himself ready to never let it go, to never let this uh, conviction go. Um, on the other side, Boethius's seemingly unshakable convincement on the rationality of the cosmos leaves his physician completely astonished. Um, in some way, 
uh, alimenting her curiosity on the case. She says, how odd. Um, I find it utterly astonishing that you are sick when, you, when your beliefs are so wholesome. But let me probe deeper, she continues, for I suspect that something is missing here. So if, if Boethius's mind is now clouded with passions, um, as we may here try to reconstruct a little bit uh, Lady Philosophy's line of reasoning uh, at this stage, um, these passions must have breached somewhere and found their way into Boethius's. But where? That's the question. Where? Where is this missing element in Boethius's system of belief that may have rendered his constitution penetrable by the passions? So uh, three such leaks, three such gaps uh, are identified by lady philosophy in uh, the subsequent paragraphs. First, despite being assured uh, that it is indeed God that governs the cosmos, Boethius demonstrates himself fundamentally incapable of understanding, let alone uh, possibly answering uh, the following questions. How do you think, how do you envisage God um, weld, wielding his, the reins? That is to say, uh, what are the instruments of God governance, of God governance of the world? Secondly, the second um, gap, um, despite knowing that God is the principle of everything, um, Boethius's current grief, his current um, um, pain, also prevented him from recalling what the answer was to the following question. Quote, what is the final purpose of the world, the goal to which uh, the whole order of nature proceeds, end quote. So these are the first two flaws from where arguably uh, the passions that now agitates um, Boethius's mind infiltrated him. She says, I was certainly not mistaken in assuming some defect in your makeup, Lady Philosophy declares. It is like a gap in a fortified rampart through which the disease of emotional disturbance, that is the disease, the morbus perturbationum, um, has permeated into your mind, end quote. But the third and more worrying ignorance of all, standing at the source of Boethius's health problems, his most preoccupying flaw, um, as Lady Philosophy's uh, line of questioning reveals, concerns the knowledge of what essentially a human being is. And let me report to you this little dialogical exchange between the two. Um, can you define what a man is, Lady Philosophy asks Boethius. Are you asking if I'm aware that I'm a mortal creature endowed with reason? Yes, I know that, and I proclaim it, Boethius replies. But are you aware of being anything more? Um, Lady Philosophy replies again, and he says, concluding, no, nothing more, end quote. So the unveiling of these three ignorances, of these three forms of ignorance, uh, which are, uh, interestingly, the very same three that uh, Courcel had elected um, as the organizing principle of the entire Consolatio, uh, this, this three ignorances mark the end of the long diagnostic process that occupies book one and announces the beginning of the therapy in the following book. So I have now fully elicited the causes of your illness, um, Lady Philosophy says, and the means of recovering your health, end quote. So Boethius's Letargus, as Lady Philosophy summarizes her findings, is to be attributed to three causes. First, she says, forgetting who you are has made you confused. And this is why you are upset at being both exiled and stripped of your possessions. Secondly, since you are unaware of the goal to which creation proceeds, you imagine that wicked and unprincipled individ individuals are powerful and blessed. And thirdly, and finally, since you have forgotten the reins that control the world, you believe that the changes of fortune which have befallen you are random and unguided, 
end quote. So we now actually have um, an exhaustive picture of Boethius's condition, of its causes, and more importantly, of a possible therapeutic treatment. So lady philosophy will thus cure Boethius's uh, disorder of the passions by means of poultices of fomenta. And, his, um, and she will treat his lethargy by means of remedia, of remedies. She says, quote, it is not yet time for stronger remedies. So I shall try for a little while uh, to break up this cloud of passions with gentle and limited poultices so that once the darkness of deceiving emotions is dispersed, you can acknowledge the brightness of true light, of the true light, end quote. So as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, um, it is my contention that it is precisely this distinction between remedies and poultices, um, rather than this, the, the, the distinction between the three causes um, that Corsell proposed, uh, that should constitute the most effective organizational principle uh, by which understanding the idiosyncrasies of lady philosophy's reviews of the goods of fortune in book two and in book three, uh, to which now I shall duly turn, um, tackling the uh, therapeutic part of uh, the consolatio. Let's start with the fomenta, the poultices. So at the onset of book two, after a short preamble, Lady Philosophy announces to her patient that the time now has finally come uh, for him to start his treatment with the already prescribed fomenta, commencing with something suiting and pleasurable in order later on to progress with um, stronger draughts, uh, validiores haustus. This gentle fomenta, as we are successively told, will be administered uh, by means of the persuasion of sweet sounding rhetoric, which is in itself an interesting uh, point to make. So starting from these premises, um, the Italian scholar Donato uh, convincing, convincingly shown, has convincingly shown that lady philosophy's discourse was, will resort to a series of uh, conventional consolatory strategies that, um, that were already propounded by a variety of ancient authors, Cicero included, um, operating with this, this ancient rhetorical tradition. Let me quote uh, from uh, Cicero's um, Tusculan Disputations. Um, he says, some hold that the comforter has only one responsibility, that is to teach the suffered that what happened is not an evil at all. This is the view of Cleantes. Others, including the peripatetics, would teach that it is not a great evil. Still others, for example, Epicurus, would draw attention away from evils and towards good things. And there are yet other, like the Cyrenaics, who think it's sufficient to show that nothing has happened contrary to expectation. Finally, he concludes, um, there are those who bring together all these types of consolation, since different methods work for different people. In my consolations, um, Cicero tells us, for instance, I combined virtually all these methods into a single speech of consolations. For my mind, he tells us, was swollen, and I was trying out every remedy I could. So as we shall see, very much like Cicero himself, whose mind is similarly uh, swollen, similarly uh, tumorized, Boethius recurs to virtually all of these consolatory methods um, together throughout the entirety of book two. It is the Cyrenaic uh, consolatory method that Lady Philosophy first administers to Boethius, showing him that mutability and fickleness um, is exactly uh, the defined feature of fortune's conduct and nature, and that really nobody uh, can reasonably expect 
fortune to be otherwise. Boethius' response to this preliminary treatment is actually very interesting, as uh, it is the patient himself that, um, having not registered uh, the um, twofold treatment pathway that uh, Lady Philosophy assigned him, uh, he laments the inefficacy of, the, of this consolatory fomentum, of this um, poultice, um, for a serious case such as his. He says, quote, true, these are uh, plausible arguments, thickly smeared as they are with the sweet honey of rhetoric and music. They afford momentary pleasure as we listen to them. But when people are unhappy, awareness of their misery runs deeper. So once these words cease to echo in our ears, uh, the grief implanted in our hearts outweighs them, end quote. So to Boethius's complaint, Lady Philosophy uh, rejoins reiterating once again her assigned treatment pathway, taking care this time to stress possibly even more the functions and, and the aims that uh, these different remedies, these different medicaments have in the treatment pathway. In fact, she says, the fact is that as yet, such words are no remedy. There are no remedia for your sickness. At this stage, they serve merely as a poultice, as a fomenta uh, for the pain which stubbornly resists all healing. When the time is ripe, I shall apply remedies to penetrate deep within the skin, end quote. So Boethius's perplexities on the suitability of lady philosophy's poultices imposes, impose her now a change of consolatory strategy. So in prose three and four, um, lady philosophy uh, tests on her patient the Epicurean consolatory method. That is uh, to divert Boethius's attention away from his present misfortunes, the so-called avocatio, and uh, towards and directing Boethius's attention towards the fortunes that he enjoyed in his past and, and the many more of that notwithstanding um, his uh, current situation, he's still, he's lucky enough to be able to still enjoy in the present. So after all, as Lady Philosophy reminds Boethius in this uh, paragraphs, as an orphan, uh, Boethius was adopted and cared for by distinguished men. Marrying Symmachus' daughter, he became part of one of the leading families in Rome. And he, and eventually also his sons, enjoyed political offices and a great deal of popularity. Moreover, of all these goods that fortune lent to him, Lady Philosophy uh, reminds Boethius at this stage, um, Boethius is still enjoying the most precious of this um, goods, which is Symmachus, his father-in-law, is still well and alive. His wife, as well, lives on. And also his sons still enjoy their respective consular ranks. So relevantly for my purposes, uh, to Lady Philosophy's Epicurean consolatory strategy, there follows then the so-called Aristotelian section of the consolatio, the one that Eusener famously regarded as being a readaptation of the material from the Protrepticus, which is a detailed sur survey of the goods of fortune, among which we count in order riches, political offices, and glory. As Lady Philosophy tells us in Prose uh, 5, quote, now that the warming poultices of my arguments are penetrating more deeply below your skin, I must, I think, make the dressing stronger, validioribus, end quote. Differently from what scholars have so far suggested, I think it is rather evident here that philosophy is not suggesting the passage to different kind of medicaments that is the passage from fomenta from poultices to remedia, which actually are here not even mentioned. And uh, we, we could think, why would they even be mentioned considering that Boethius has not evidently recovered from his uh, disorder of the passions. Actually, 
uh, I think that Lady Philosophy is he here suggesting the passage to stronger compositions of the same medicament. That is to say, she's suggesting to shift from Leniora to Validiora Fomenta, to shift from uh, lighter to stronger uh, poultices. To corroborate my interpretation, we see that the stronger poultice that Lady Philosophy now administers to her patient um, is yet another of the consolatory methods that Cicero listed in the Tusculans, this time that of the stoic Cleantes, or somewhat similarly, the peripatetics. That is to say, uh, to teach the one who suffers that what happened is not an evil at all, or at least that it is not a great evil. In the second half of book two, in fact, Lady Philosophy takes it upon herself to demonstrate to Boethius that the, gifts, the, the gift of fortune, uh, that is riches, political offices, and glory, are only relatively relative and not absolute goods. Um, goods whose laws any rational human being would regard as being either not an evil at all, as per Cleantes, or only a minor evil, as for the uh, peripatetics. But now let's move to the second and final stage of uh, Lady Philosophy's uh, treatment pathway, that of the remedia, of the remedies. So um, I find additional evidence in favor of my thesis that the passage that I just quoted uh, does not really mark the beginning of the administration of remedia, um, in the opening prose of book three. There, it is in fact Boethius himself that uh, showing, encouraging um, signs of recovery from his uh, disorder of the passions, uh, he requests his physician to pass to the second stage of the prescribed um, treatment pathway. He says, you are indeed the greatest comfort for weary spirits, what refreshment you have brought me with the depth of your judgment and the sweetness of your songs. I no longer count myself unable to bear the future blows of fortune. So far from dreading those remedies, those remedia, uh, which you said would sting a little more, I'm eager to hear them and I pressingly demand them, end quote. Now, thanks to the sweetness of Lady Philosophy's consolatory discourses, Boethius seems now to, have, to be fully on board with the therapeutic plan. Lady Philosophy is pleased by her patient's positive response to the treatment, and following his request, she finally concedes him to administer the remedia, the remedies. She says, the medicines remaining for you to take are uh, the kind which are bitter on the tongue, but sweet when swallowed. As for your saying that you're keen to hear them, uh, your enthusiasm would grow wide hot if you realize the goal to which I intend to lead you. As Lady Philosophy will soon reveal to her patient, where she's intending to lead Boethius is actually to true happiness. So also at this uh, second uh, therapeutic stage, as in the first, Lady Philosophy's approach is cautious and gradual. To Boethius' enthusiastic request that, sh that she shows him without hesitation where true happiness res uh, resides, she replies, uh, quote, I shall do so and gladly for your sake. But first, I shall try to depict and express in words something more familiar to you. And once you have that in mind, you can turn your gaze in the other direction and acknowledge the beauty of true happiness." End quote. Um, that which, according to Lady Philosophy, Boethius is already familiar with, and in contrast to which, he will eventually be able to recognize what true happiness is, um, is the very same set of external goods that were already scrutinized in the second part of book two, and that Lady Philosophy will now take up again 
uh, in the first half of book three, that is to say wealth, offices, uh, kingship, glory, and carnal pleasures. As some scholars did not fail to notice, uh, this bipartition of book three um, into a parse destrance, um, um, destructive parts, uh, let's say, intended to demonstrate the vanity of the goods of fortune on the one side, and on the other, a parse costrance, a constructive part, uh, meant to show the nature of true happiness on the other, clearly reflects also the conventional organization of the ancient uh, protractic, of the ancient exhortative discourse. Uh, the, the distinction of the ancient protractic discourse into a so-called, thank you, apotreptic and a properly protractic part, which is to say a part intended to dissuade someone from engaging in, into something, which is the apotreptic part, and a part, the properly protractic part, uh, intended to exhort someone um, to engage into something. Now, if any doubt should persist at this stage concerning the correspondence between the administration of remedies in book three with the uh, inception of the properly protractic part of the consolatio, uh, suffice it here to attend to two following considerations. So firstly, uh, we shall note that the so-called eudaimonistic axiom in which both Cicero's Hortensius and then most probably Aristotle's Protrepticus uh, began and had their inception, appears also precisely at this point in the narrative of the Consolatio. There we read, mortal creature have one overall concern. Um, this they work at by toiling over a whole range of pursuits, advancing on different paths, but striving to attain the one goal of happiness. End quote. And this, as you can see from the slide, has an almost perfect correspondence with um, the respective fragments of the Hortensius and the Protrepticus. Moreover, and this is the second point, in the conclusive prosa of book three, we find lady philosophy scorning the search for material goods and promoting the quest for uh, the spiritual ones of spiritual goods in a way that is entirely analogous to that of fragment B105 of Aristotle's Protrepticus, which I here report on the slides to ease the uh, comparison. Well, let's move to the um, to, uh, conclusive section of this presentation. So my study has hopefully demonstrated that um, as Ado repeatedly suggested throughout his body of work, the most effective way of making sense of the textual idiosyncrasies of any ancient work, as Boethius's Consolatio still undoubtedly is, I think, even if perhaps the last one of them, um, the best way to make sense of these idiosyncrasies is uh, to, reconduct, uh, to reconduct them to the living praxis from which they might have originated in the first place, which in Boethius's case, uh, they are the unfortunate state of spiritual unrest, uh, which uh, Boethius was going through while being imprisoned and while waiting for his execution in Pavia. As I suggested, as I've tried to suggest, um, it is precisely reading the medical analogy from this existential perspective that we can best account also for the repetitiveness of ladies' philosophies' um, surveys of the goods of fortune in book two and book three. So as we have seen again, the first catalog is part of a series of consolatory discourses that um, uh, as poultices, as fomenta, are administered to Boethius throughout book two. We, with the intent in mind of consoling Boethius uh, on his misfortunes and also dispelling the passions um, that obfuscated his judgment, his reasoning, 
that is his morbus perturbationum. But we have also seen that the second survey um, of the goods of fortune is um, as the so-called uh, apotreptic part of a protreptic of an exhortative discourse that as a remedy, uh, as a remedium, Boethius uh, is being handed out in book three with the purpose of awakening him um, from his temporary slumber, from his lethargy, and to bring him back, to convert him back to the philosophical way of living. So uh, in order to conclude, if, um, as the Italian um, scholar Alfonsi noted early on, uh, in between book two and book three, uh, Boethius has indeed uh, wisely managed to combine these two genres into one, that is the consolatory and the protreptic genre, I think uh, Boethius did so not in the specific way in which the Italian scholar interpreted him. So he says, uh, and I here I shall quote from a very popular paper by Alfonsi, he says, Boethius has adopted and inserted in the consolatio as the very first negative has i'm sorry his has inserted the consolatio as the very as the first negative part of the protreptic the consolatory part which by destroying worldly illusions comforts the soul represents the negative aspect dialectically serving the positive which he concludes is a real protreptic so I think as the distinction between remedies and poultices in Boethius's medical analogy allowed us to ascertain, uh, there appears to be no proper overlap in the consolatio between consolatory and protreptic discourses. Actually, the, protre the apotreptic part of the protreptic discourse is so masterfully stitched to the consolatory discourse in the passage from book two to book three to create the impression that no solution of continuity subsists uh, between their respective surveys of the goods of fortune. And is actually precisely here, this is exactly the point uh, uh, from which the per perceived strangeness of Lady Philosophy's argument, a method of argumentation in book two and book three arises. And this, uh, it's also here that I shall stop. And thank you for your time and patience. So thank you very much, Dr. Matteo Stettler, for your presentation, your very beautiful and uh, <laughs> a complete presentation about, uh, about what's his uh, conservation and philosophy. Uh, well, I will speak uh, a bit in Portuguese and a bit in English, just to uh, make possible um, a broader, um, uh, a broader conversation for um, ten minutes, fifteen minutes more or less. Muito obrigado, portanto, Mateo Stetler por esta apresentação, que também acho nos permite, uh, if I speak as well, maybe probably you can understand. Yeah, yeah probably. You have also Italian in your, in your mind, so I think it should help. Yeah. Uh, uma apresentação que também nos dá, por um lado, a possibilidade de ver como uh, o protrético de Aristóteles não teve uma influência escondida hein, através uh, do estoicismo de Kikru, nos primeiros autores cristãos, do qual Boetius, evidentemente, é um representante é, crucial. E, e, ao mesmo tempo, também, isto nos dá uma, uh, dois elementos sobre os quais fico a pensar. Por um lado, esta presença de Aristóteles, que, é, embora tenha sido esquecido por uma boa parte da Idade Média e só recuperado depois, basicamente, com as primeiras traduções dos árabes, mas, ao mesmo tempo, através desta linha histórica e de Boetio, continua como protréptico a influenciar a Idade Média e a chegar, basicamente, numa, na, na, na perspectiva, por exemplo, que é a da nossa própria investigação ao interior desta linha, a influenciar todas as formas de conversão que nós teremos ao longo, 
no início, evidentemente, da, um, da Idade Média e depois, no, no, no próprio começo da modernidade, com o próprio Inácio de Loyola. Eu não sei se, por acaso, é, é obviamente um tema de estudo que pode ser abordado neste momento, sem dúvida, Inácio foi influenciado por fontes históricas, portanto, também por grandes clássicos de, da, retórica, da retórica antiga e, sem dúvida, por Agostinho, sem dúvida também por uma leitura de Boesos. Seria extremamente interessante ver como esta linha depois se desenvolve até os primeiros jesuítas e até influencia depois os primeiros jesuítas. Temos claramente testemunho do facto que Agostinho seja um, um elemento fundamental, mas quanto Boetio seja também isso, é, pode ser um, é, compreendido, talvez, talvez melhor. Uh, well, I um, just a question so for you, uh, just to understand well, the first question, you know, the first question um, for my part, but of course I open uh, the conversation also with your, uh, the participants. Um, uh, it's very interesting also uh, two, two things. The first one, how um, the, the two elements uh, you um, provide in uh, in your studies that is uh, the conservatory part and the um, um, protract part uh, through the Aristotelian source but uh, manage this form of uh, therapy you know? uh, and how uh, so philosophy uh, continue to be continue to represent also for Goethe a form of therapy uh, against uh, against illness. That is a theme that we also encounter in, uh, in spirituality and also the spiritual um, uh, forms of life uh, continuing there. Uh, so that is uh, the first uh, first theme that uh, we would uh, focus. On. And of course, I am ask you uh, eventually to 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 give some our uh, ideas about this. And, well, and the second one, of course, is, uh, is this. Um, uh, how for you, you know, in this case, you know, we know that uh, the consolation of philosophy uh, takes Boetius uh, in a very difficult moment of his life. You know? um, so he's a, he's a um, Christian, Christian mm -hmm. author, but at the same time, this uh, Christian author um, constraint in prison in this time, he writes uh, as something having to do with philosophy. So how uh, we could uh, understand or interpret this recovery of philosophy uh, through uh, Christian and uh, of course um, um, in the field of uh, a Christian uh, um, spiritual, um, manifestly uh, spiritual form of uh, life. These two things for the time. Yeah, these are both um, great questions that really um, highlight some major points um, in the in the in the consolatio, and are very important very important junctures to understand what Boethius is still doing, and perhaps what he would like to do with his text. So, the first element concerning the first element concerning the therapeutic import of this text and of the conception of philosophy as therapy. But what, what struck me the most is actually the big role that also rhetoric has, in, at least in the initial stage, to correct, let's say, the modus perturbation, the disorder of the passions. And this is actually a very, um, I, I'm, I'm sure this is a, a sort of remnant from the protractic tradition itself, uh, insofar as uh, one of the main, one of the defining elements of every protractic discourse of, of antiquity is um, the subjection of the art of rhetoric to the guide and command. Well, it's, it's not a prerogative only of protractic discourses, but that, that sort of a relationship between rhetoric and philosophy emerges more clearly in protractic discourses, in which uh, rhetoric is uh, least is not is not um, simply uh, just contrasted with philosophy. It's only uh, somehow subjected to uh, philosophy's guidance. So that's the reason why, for example, here we can find an entire um, 
uh, an entire book actually, book two, which is devoted to a rhetorical uh, sort of therapy in this sense, which coincides with consultatory discourses, of course. Um, concerning uh, the second element, which is um, the, uh, the interaction between um, and the recovery of philosophy in a moment of um, spiritual hardship, such as the one that uh, Boethius is going through. As an of course. Right, right. And that's, that's actually um, uh, points to uh, an incredible, as I mentioned at the opening of my, of my presentation, that points to a very complex interpretative issue uh, with uh, the Boethius Consolatio. The, um, the consensus, more or less the consensus, nowadays in studies on Boethius is that, uh, well perhaps not the consensus, but the most recent and uh, studies on Boethius Consolatio is that uh, the first three books, what the first three books uh, build on philosophy, the later two like uh, destruct somehow. So uh, the idea being uh, mostly advanced by a scholar like Relihan uh, the American scholar, that uh, we should reconduct in the end the entire consolatio to the genre of the ancient of the ancient uh, Militean satire, which is to say that we should somehow interpret the whole uh, work in an ironic manner, which is uh, which means that um, the Boethius' recovery of philosophy is not a real recovery. What he wanted to do, according to his scholars, is that Boethius' appeals to philosophy in this last work of his, because this was his last work before uh, his sentence and his execution, uh, he recovered philosophy only to show the limits of philosophy. How, and, and in a very silent manner, because of course there is no reference to Christianity in the entire no, consolatio. Yeah. That's right. So to, to suggest in a very silent manner that uh, the real solution in such a situation would be uh, an appeal to faith, and something like that. So, yes, the result is the faith. That's right. That's yeah. right. But it, it, but it, it is, is a silent implication. It is not explicit. Yeah. It is not, it's not explicit. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, there, there are some scholars who have tried to find uh, some hidden references, the subtext, the study the subtext of some of the passages to interpret them in that direction. But again, yeah. Okay. Look, I have a, a more two questions, but we have uh, just a few time, and uh, we have uh, well, many compliments, uh, <laughs> compliments and compliments, <laughs> different, uh, from uh, Andres Linde, João Batista, or Professor D'Agostino, from my. É, mas temos uma pergunta da parte de João Batista, pronto, que é, que eu queria deixar para ti, uh, que é, o que, se quiseres dizer, o que motivou o teu estudo, what motivated your, your kind of studies and your, I think, your, if uh, it's correct, uh, your focus on, uh, on Boetz, yeah, uh, the focus on Boetz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, there was actually, um, um, this is actually the last, was supposed to be the last chapter of my doctoral thesis. Most probably I won't be able to include this because it is already too large and it would be uh, a little bit too much. But, but we can say that you're, you're, you're publishing something uh, that's from, right, this, from, from, from this, right, right. Presentation. this, this, this so presentation and is being published. So I, well, I, I, I also say to, to his listening that uh, uh, we will try to, to do um, a short book or something mm -hmm. so uh, from our seminar. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe next year or something so, but we will try to, to, to do it in Portuguese. Right. In Portuguese. <laughs> and so what drove me to uh, investigate this theme is uh, simply because I was studying and I am studying um, the um, reception of Aristotle's Protrepticus in the early Christian author. So, and the, and actually very interestingly, Boethius is the last, Boethius's Consolatio is the last philosophical works um, of the ancient world to still contain uh, even perhaps only a passing reference or the influence of Aristotle's Protractus. Afterwards, it is traditionally understood that there are no, there, there are not any more references to, to the Protractus and then 
it gets lost uh, into, in the ancient world. Well, with the beginning of the mid mid Middle Ages, really. So, so that's somehow Boethius stands at the pinnacle of this um, historical investigation that I conducted. Because it was the last author in which we could find some references, however brief, to this tradition. And it is the last author who uses uh, protractic discourse, as far as we know, yeah? as far as those works that have uh, survived. And it, that's actually very interesting for me, insofar as I think what, what I'm doing in my work is assuming that there is an intrinsic, like a very intimate uh, relationship between the ancient conception of philosophy as a way of life with the protractic genre, with the protractic genre of writing. Um, insofar as I, I would contend, there is no, uh, there's, if there is no life to convert to, if there is no philosophical life to convert to, there is no need anymore to have a protractic discourse. And that's interesting that we cannot find any more evidence of uh, Aristotle's protracticus after after Boethius' Consolatio, which means that somehow in that period also the philosophical way of life have to have disappeared at a certain time, which is you know my my inference from from this element. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah. E então não sei se há é, alguma pergunta, alguma sugestão ou uma, pedidos de esclarecimento da parte de alguém. É, João Batista, desculpa, não, não se ouve. Tem que, tem que abrir o microfone. Não sei se estava a falar. Ok, não, é só para agradecer. <risos> Bom, não sei se mais alguém quer, temos mesmo poucos, poucos minutos, mesmo para fechar aqui na sala ou também a distância. De outra forma, tenho uma, uma, uma última, verdadeiramente uma última é, pergunta para o Mateu, que pronto, é mais focada sobre esta questão da própria conversão. Não? É, na, no, aqui temos, digamos assim, por um lado, esta é, conversão através da terapia, não? Uhum. E, e ao mesmo tempo, sendo também um dos textos que envolve o, a, a herdade do profético, é, temos também a educação. A conversão e a educação são os dois momentos é, do, nosso, do nosso seminário não? Que, vamos, que vamos alternar. E, e precisamente, ao mesmo tempo, temos uma. É, Pronto, e fazendo no seguimento da tua resposta do antes, temos também uma uh, espécie, digamos assim, de um, área não? O particular em que temos uma espiritualidade, da qual fala, fala o, o próprio Adolfo, fala o próprio uhum. Foucault, uh, que, mesmo sendo religiosa, neste caso, também no caso da Boetzi, mas também, ao mesmo tempo, revela a importância também da sua própria gênese de uma espiritualidade não religiosa. Não? não sei se podemos encontrar esta forma de, eh, eh, Digo, também nessa transição, evidentemente, que nós temos eh, entre uma forma de vida, entre uma filósofa, uma filosofia como uma maneira de viver na antiguidade e na modernidade, também essa transição de uma espiritualidade que pode ser atingida, às vezes, pela filosofia, às vezes, pela religião, ou declinar-se de forma diferente. Uh, did you understand that? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. I, I think I got the gist of, uh, and this is actually uh, this is one of the things that the of this of this text that have um, um, attracted my interest the most. I think because the conversion that Boethius is trying to um, subject himself to, so this return to philosophy that he is trying to. Um, to achieve by exhorting himself with this exhortative discourse, it is fully a kind of, of, of uh, it, it reveals the presence of a notion of conversion, which I think is strictly philosophical and not necessarily religious in the sense, because um, Boethius, uh, this is not like, the Boethius was actually a philosopher. He was, before uh, being in prison, etc., he was already philosophy. He has been instructed in philosophy. He has been by philosophy, and there are many references in the text concerning his education with the Aleatics, uh, etc. So what's the most interesting in this text is that uh, a conversion in the philosophy, yeah. 
sorry, all the source of Boetius are uh, Aristotelian. <laughs> Not all of them, like, it's a, Boetius had like, uh, tons of sources, like for every kind of possible text, or I mean, every kind of influence that has been identified in the text, let's say. Um, there is a, certainly a, a huge platonic influence, and, uh, but again, what what's, seems to be very interesting to me is like that this is a conversion of someone that had already converted to philosophy, actually. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, and that's one of the main characteristics, as far as I understand, um, the ancient notion of philosophical conversion. That's one of the, ancient, the, the main characteristics of the ancient philosophical conversion, which is um, an act which is not a singular act. It's an act that has to be uh, reconferred whenever you need to. Like, whenever you lose your orientation towards philosophy, you've got to reconvert yourself. Ado points this out at times in his writings, that especially ancient philosophical conversion was, not, was more of an attitude, really, an attitude of reorientation towards the philosophical life. It is not a single act. It is also a single act, like the first act when you decide to embark on the philosophical life, but at the very same time, it is an act that you have to, um, uh, to yeah, to, to to repeat throughout your life, to um, in order to reorient yourself and to in, insofar as leading a philosophical life is uh, it's a difficult task, and um, it's 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 something it's a reactivity that has to be um, reactivated throughout your lifetime, especially in difficult circumstances, such as the one that Boethius was undergoing, which are circumstances in which, perhaps, again, you see, you forget how to behave like a philosopher, because you are so um, overwhelmed by what happened to you, what it, by your passions, uh, as in Boethius's case. So again, like the, the notion of, philosophical, of a philosophical conversion, which is not um, closely uh, associated with that of a religious conversion, which is more like a leap into the dark, or or a leap into the dark, but um, not necessarily. But uh, it's the beginning. It, it doesn't mark just the beginning of the philosophical life, but it is the philosophical life itself. It is uh, again, it, it needs this reactivation from. Okay, well, but maybe we will also encounter this uh, uh, this form of conversion mm -hmm. as that uh, is uh, taken by by uh, well, the first Christian authors from philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what well, reactivated uh, in, uh, in other forms. Um, of course, we have a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. uh, just not Augustine and what is are, right. are the main uh, ones. Well, we are we are just at the end of, uh, of our. I ah, know. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Just a, a very very short. The hand. Yes, the hand. The hand. The hand. Just it's a very a very short uh -huh. question to to Marta, and we finish with it. Very short, unfortunately, because we are at the end. Marta? Yeah. Okay. Good evening and thank you for our presentation. Um, I became curious about this. What's the difference between a religious conversion and philosophical conversion? Could you, <laughs> could you explain in, in short words? Well, we could speak for one, <laughs> for one week about this. Well, yeah. Um, so it's, again, it's a very thank you for for your question. It's a, a it is an entire project of research. I think it's also part of your work, right? So I it's, mean, it's, 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 it's my next hour. So, <laughs> I, so it, again, I would say it is um, in many respects is still a very um, investigated um, question. I think there are, uh, I could try and and and, and uh, provide a very a uh, temporary answer to it. Um, according, uh, as far as my understanding goes, I would say that, um, again, th there has been also, of course, you have to understand that there has been, of course, uh, that the ancient philosophical conversion uh, was uh, an act, let's say, an element, a spiritual element that was eventually integrated into Christianity starting from uh, the ancient paganism. So, the idea that conversion does not originate with Christianity, uh, but has an important antecedent in the pagan philosophers, and this is again, uh, Ado has uh, very interesting studies in this direction. I would say that the main difference 
as far as I understand them, um, between the religious and philosophical conversion, I would say that the philosophical conversion is not a singular act. So uh, that you have to reiterate the act of conversion uh, throughout your lifetime to um, fundamentally, again, reactivate the fundamental choice of life that you've made by uh, taking an affiliation with a particular uh, school, a philosophical school, which is something which I'm not sure we can find in Christianity. So for example, if you're a Stoic, um, you have completed your first education and then you, you want to convert to the philosophical way of this Stoic way of life. So you belong to the school of Xeno, etc. So the very first act uh, where, uh, by which you enter uh, the Stoic, for example, and then you take that decision that from that moment onward you're going to try and act as a Stoic philosopher. That's not all, that's not, that's not the only act of conversion that you are going to have to perform throughout your lifetime. It's, a, it's, it's an always fragile effort, right? You have always to reactivate that specific choice of life, which is, in the Stoic case, that of living according to nature. It's something that you have to strive constantly to do. And that's interesting why, um, um, yeah, that's I would that's what I what I what the kind of answer answer that I would sketch to this enormous question. But I, I'm sure you have something to add to this. Well, to add to that, maybe not because <laughs> well, um, I personally disagree with you in the sense that I think that we have also in philosophy something uh, concerning the epiphany. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, we have these two kinds of uh, conversion: the uh, istrofe and metanoia. Right. But, uh, for instance, Ado mm -hmm. does not mention this idea of epiphany, mm -hmm. that is the moment. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, well, in this, we have in St. Paul conversions, for instance, mm -hmm. we have a manifestation of epiphany. Right. In uh, Augustine, mm -hmm. we have an epiphany, mm -hmm. of course they are religious, uh, but well, in this kind of epiphany, we, we can meet uh, uh, both the religion and the philosophy. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. Well, but of course, I mean, it's, it's conversion that we can continue. So it's very interesting. It's, uh, there's well, actually a lot of continuity. That's true. It's, it's yeah. hard, in fact, yeah. uh, to, to to identify points of continuity and discontinuity. Yeah, of course, of course. So, for example, think of just the problem of orienting. Right. So the orienting. Uh, I think so. uh, Which is the direction in which. Uh, that's right. Yeah. But of course, the idea of ascesis mm -hmm. um, for the side of the ascesis, qual è l'importanza della scesa, l'importanza della ginnastica, no? Isto sem dúvida è importante per la religione e come è importante anche la filosofia. And see, for example, there is the case of Augustine. Augustine, in yeah. fact, he was. Uh, there is an amazing uh, testimony in Augustine's Confessions in which he says that he was first converted to God, actually, to, flock, to truth and God, that's what I, what I said, by reading Cicero's Hortensius, which was an exhortation to philosophy. So again, uh, that act of conversion that was or, you know, originally thought to, uh, to be a conversion towards philosophy ends up in, in Augustine's hands as a conversion eventually to God and Christianity. Yeah. So there are a lot of continuities if, yeah, we can certainly find Fine, what a time we use there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bem, obrigado a todos, então, a todas as participantes, a todos os colegas, os amigos, as amigas que estiveram conosco. Thank you very much, once more, uh, Mateo, for having accepted our invitation for uh, uh, this uh, uh, fifth session of our seminar in occupation education at uh, our Center of Global Studies at the Universidade de Aberta. Um, next and the last session for, uh, uh, for this part of the year uh, before the holidays will be, in, uh, will be the 1st of uh, July. Uh, portanto, dou uma, uh, pronto, uma, um, uma Deus uh, temporário às pessoas que nos estão a seguir até o próximo 1 de Julho. Uh, mais obrigado. Mais uma vez, obrigado a todos, a todos os presentes e a Iamantef. Tchau. Então...